Great job. Wow. Well, that was good. That was good. Wow, that was great. That was good stuff. I said, what? I, I've done uh, <clears throat> uh, a, lot of, a lot of men's retreats through the years and a lot of singing, a lot of guys, did, but, but none is better than that right there. And uh, just, I tell you what. It's a good, just good, good stuff. And, uh, it's good to, uh, huh? I said, our band rocks. Your band rocks, I guarantee you. <laughs> they, they are good. And uh, I, uh, excited about tonight. Uh, excited. Uh, I guess we got this session, and then we're going to do a little bonfire action. And uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be good. Yeah, huh? walk on water. Yeah. Walk on water, okay, there we go. <laughs> I like that, and uh, 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 this evening <coughs> we're going to um, talk about um, um, just, um, uh, you know, again, just um, uh, living a life worthy of imitation, being, being uh, that man that God's called me to be and, and doing what God's asked me to do and as a man, as a husband, as a father, as a, as a Christian uh, and, and all that stuff. And, and this evening is just, uh, you know, uh, an area I think we all, we, we, we uh, need to consider, <laughs> even though it's not, it's not as much fun talking about all, all this stuff and it's, it's a little more of a challenge and a little more serious, but uh, necessary. To talk about that, because here's here's the the uh, the uh, thought, or the theme for tonight is, it's to um, identify and address fatal flaws in my life. To identify and address anything in my life that that uh, if the enemy is going to use to bring me down and accomplish his will in my life, the enemy's will. And of course, we know what his will is. His will is clearly stated in John 10. At 10, his, his um, uh, he, a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And, and that's the way of the world. And, and the end result is, at the end result of all of that, what the enemy wants to do is to destroy. Now, Jesus has come, same verse says, so we might have life and have it in all its fullness. Life in, in a meaningful life now, abundant life now, life in its fullness now, and life forever and ever with him in, in a glory uh, 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 for uh, eternity. But it just makes, you know, and, and if you consider it, it just makes sense that it's, obvi it's obvious that's what the enemy wants to do. Because there's been a, a, a war, a spiritual war happening since way back when uh, Satan became Satan and, 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 and a third of the demons were cast out of out of heaven and just are doing what they do, and, and of course they are classically anti-God, anti-Jesus. And, and of course you know there's always spirit in the world that, that's, that's anti-Christ, uh, anti who he is, what he stands for, what he does, um, uh, uh, his church, his word, his, his will, all that stuff. And just, uh, of course one day we're going to see the, the ultimate manifestation of that uh, anti-Christ in a person. A, a real a person on the earth is going to be anti all that. Well, it just makes sense what the enemy wants to do is to undo what God has done. And God has created for beauty and glory and, 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 and all of that stuff. All the things heaven will ultimately be, beauty, glory, uh, a wonder, just all, all of that stuff. The enemy wants to undo, uh, undo that and, and, and cause doubt and confusion and, and, and anger and, and despair and all that stuff. And it uh, also makes sense that the enemy wants to make sure his, his first attack in a man's life is he wants to make sure the man never trusts Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Because the enemy wants that man in his camp because he wants his soul. He wants him dead. He wants, he, he wants him to live a, a meaningless uh, existence on the earth and, and in the end experience eternal damnation in hell. That's what Satan's all about. And it just makes sense what he wants to do. Let's make sure a man never, never first trusts Jesus Christ as Savior. You know, I'm sure we got testimonies of guys in the room who in years, and you were against this whole Jesus thing, against this whole church thing and Bible thing and 
preacher thing and all this stuff. I mean, you laughed at it. You hated it. You were against it. You ran as far as you could from that. And, uh, and the enemy was thrilled to have you where you were. Uh, but somehow, supernaturally, uh, 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 miraculously, God's light, God's love broke through. And you know what? You realize I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. He's a Savior. And you, you confess your sin, surrender your life, ask Jesus Christ into your life, and you got saved. You got born again. And, and you know what? Now, basically, every story is just incredible. In fact, uh, it's, a, it's an awesome, it's, it's a, one of the most enjoyable things that there is, is just to have guys stand up and say, hey, these are I came to know Jesus. Because it's always unbelievable. It's always incredible. It's always just. But now, now that a man has accepted Jesus Christ, Satan has lost that battle. So now his assignment is he wants to rob from that man. And, and first make sure that, that man never, that he always doubts the word of God. That, uh, or he denies the word of God. Or, or he's just stealing from the man. He just wants the man never to experience the fullness of what Jesus Christ wants to have in, uh, in, uh, in his life. And ultimately, what, what, what Satan likes to do is just find something in the man, just, a, just a, an area. That he says he just attacks the man. And it is our fatal flaw. And the fact is, every man has something. In fact, what a fatal flaw I guess is a fatal flaw is any area or areas where Satan has his best shot at destroying my testimony, my witness, my influence for Jesus Christ. Messing up my life, my marriage, my relationship with my kids, my influence in the church of Jesus Christ, all that stuff. Just that, that, that fatal flaw. That's what Ephesians 4.27 says, hey, men, don't give any opportunity to the devil. Just close off that back door completely. And so there's no chance for the enemy because the enemy is a thief. He's a liar. And you know what the fact is? In our world, the enemy is stealing. He, he is robbing from men. He, he, he is, he's a thief. Of course, he's a liar. And uh, he's a murderer, as the Bible says. And, and what the enemy wants to do, he wants to rob uh, from men, steal from men. So here's some things that maybe... The enemy is, is, uh, is uh, robbing men of today. He's robbing men of their concept of God, of who God is. Too many men spend their whole life thinking essentially they're their own God. And there's not another God. That's how small they think that there is a God. That's how small, how, how small they think that God is. Because ultimately they think, you know, I'm going to be my own God. I can handle this thing. Or and men just kind of live their lives. Even a Christian man lives his life. Yes, there is a God, but he spends his whole life never really in, even acknowledging that God. And never. Maybe just throw him a little check every now and then. Maybe just show up at Easter and Christmas and stuff. But, 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 but uh, ultimately does not does not realize, uh, Satan wants you to think uh, God is just some, some uh, old grandfather uh, up in heaven who's got a long uh, white beard, and essentially he's impotent and powerless, and you can do whatever you want to do. Well, well uh, that's not God. You know, I just, I just had this thought. This, this, I don't know why this just popped in my head. Uh, you'd be shocked how many things just pop in my head and things, and, 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 and most, uh, most preachers are like that, right? I mean, you're up there thinking some things, and, and of course, Almost all the stuff you don't say, but you know, uh, uh, you know, I was just thinking, I was just, um, uh, I was just thinking about that. I don't know why this popped in my head, but that movie um, uh, uh, Avengers, you know, with the four guys, you know, against against the bad guy and all this stuff happens, and 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 the um, uh, evil guy was a guy named Loki, I think was his name. Huh? Loki was his name. Loki, very good. We got, <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. But uh, now I'm not going to tell the story right. I, I can tell. I, I got so much to tell. But the way I remember it, in the movie, Loki is is in this room and and Hulk, and of course, of course, of course Loki is just is just creating havoc on everything. And, and of course, he's beating all four guys at one time or another. He's knocked them down. They can't really know it. So it looks like he's going to win. So Loki's in his room, and all of a sudden, 
the Hulk shows up in the room. Of course, the Hulk has gotten mad. He's, he's, he's doing his thing. He shows up in the room, and, and um, he creates some havoc in the room. And Loki uh, uh, says something like, um, uh, something like uh, stop this. This has got to stop. What are you doing? How dare you enter my presence and, uh, into my room? And then he makes a, and then he makes a step. He says, he said, I'm a god. And Hulk walks over to him and just grabs him by the neck and just goes, boom, 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 <laughs> boom, 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 and throws him up against the wall. And Hulk walks away and goes, puny god. <laughs> well, you know what? God is an awesome. You know what? He's worthy of my life, my, my, my soul, my all, my worship. You know, the enemy wants a man, man never on his knees. The enemy wants a man never bowing his heart to God. An enemy just wants a man just full up in this whole idea of a puny God instead of a God who is our God, who, who is the God, the, the God of the universe. Uh, the enemy is robbing us of our, our unconscious. You know what? The enemy is, is also robbing us of our self-image. He's robbing us of our self-image. We think our self-image is wrapped up in what we do. We think, and, you know, all men struggle with it. I've struggled with this all my life. We think our self-image is wrapped up in, in uh, how we perform, what we got, what we look like, who we marry, and what, uh, what our kids do. We think our self-image is wrapped up in how we stack up to other men. In fact, one, most men, their, their self-image has been robbed from, because God never wanted a man to be, to have his self-image tied to anything except who he is in Christ. And in Christ, you know what, I, I am complete, perfect, just like I need to be totally and completely. I don't need anything else. I got everything I need to be saved in Jesus Christ and everything I, I, I need in Jesus. He's the man he's called me to be. But men today are just, are just robbed of that, and they think, I can have all this other stuff. In fact, too many men look to other men, and men... To make a, a decision about how I feel about myself based on how I think you feel about me. But, uh, but here's what's messed up about that. Now, now uh, I know I'm screwed up. I mean, I, I am dysfunctional. I got issues. I know I'm screwed up. Um, but here's, here's what's even more screwed up about this whole thing. I, who am screwed up, I'm going to make a... a um, and a, pin, a, a value about how I feel about myself uh, based on what I think you feel about me. And the fact is, you're more screwed up than I am. <laughs> how, messed, how messed up is that? I mean, you're looking to the world to think, hey, how do I stand up in the world? Well, the world's screwed up. Yeah, hey, you ask all these women out there, hey, how about me? How do I stand up? Well, they're screwed up as well. Hey, the fact is, an answer to that is, hey, man, find somebody who's perfect, who's got it all together, and ask him yeah, exactly. what he thinks about it. You know what? The only person that is is Jesus. That's right. And Jesus says, I accept you just the way that you are. You are totally forgiven, completely saved, changed, valued, loved, just like you. And you know why? How we can know he loves and values us for no other reason than he created us. Because God, you were made by an infinite, perfect, powerful God in heaven. And he loves you. He fashioned your life. Hey, hey, you know, John, John 9, um, when a guy's born, uh, no, he's not blind. Uh, is he blind, John 9? Well, I, I think he was blind. Um, uh, the boy. And, uh, and, they, and the, the, the Jewish leaders ask, Hey, who's sending this? Because obviously this is a mistake. Who's sending this thing? His mom, this man, or his parents? And Jesus said, hey, it wasn't a sin issue. Now this guy is as he is according to the purpose and power of God. Now, so let me read exactly what it says. Because, because it says, so that the works of God can be manifest in him. Something like, here's what it says. John, John, because I, I can see you're doubting me on this thing. I, I can see I can, I can see that. I can see that. Uh, uh, you don't believe, I can see, I can see. Uh, here's what he said, and Jesus, uh, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, 
It was not that this man sinned or his parents sinned, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. You know what? We look at a blind guy and say, that's a mistake. God says, no, it's not. I have fashioned this man for my purpose and my glory. It's the clay realizing the potter does what the potter wants to do in, in the life of the clay, and all the clay does is respond and say, Lord, it's all up here. I struggled all my life feeling, and, and, and feeling like I'm a mistake. Something wrong in the whole process. You know what I've, I've learned after all these years of life and, 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 and growing and, and knowing Jesus following me? So, you know, I'm not a mistake. Man, God, God is bigger than this stuff. And, of course, there are sins and tough things happening in the world that I cannot explain, but God is bigger than all that stuff. And he can use all that stuff according to accomplish his plan and his purpose and things. A, 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 a committer being robbed of his self-image. You know what? Now, too many guys spend their whole life just walking into a room like this or walking into a situation or just, or just whatever it is, and they walk into every situation um, worried, okay, how am I going to fit in this thing? Is anybody going to recognize me? Is anybody going to know me? Is uh, anybody going to be nice to me? Everybody's going to say something to me. And we walk in this thing, and if someone says something, we feel good. If someone does something, we walk out and say, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a nobody. I mean, it's, it's how you do. Instead of a man just feeling good about himself, he knows who he is in Christ. He's settled in that. He's happy. He's content in who he is in Christ. So he's walking in the room, even if he didn't know anybody. Hey, I don't care if anybody notices me. I'm not here to be noticed. I'm here to serve. And to see somebody who needs a touch, and I'm going to be that touch, period. You know what? It, that changes everything. Yeah, All of a sudden, I'm not tied to anybody. I'm not tied to anything. I'm not tied to anything. Because all you end up doing is realizing who I am in Christ is enough. And all I got to do is honor and glorify him. You know, you know I did this. This is kind of stupid. But, but uh, it would be a little bit like uh, if, I, uh, if I sang a song and, and of course, I love to sing, but I can't sing like you sing back there and all that stuff. But, but I love to sing. And, but uh, what if I just sang this old, this a great old chorus by, uh, well, I forgot the guy's name, but uh, Keith Green. Uh, he wrote this old, old uh, uh, this song goes like this. It goes, uh, there is a redeemer, Jesus, God's own son, precious lamb of God, Messiah, holy one. Thank you, oh, my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till your work on earth is done. You know what? You can walk out of here without a break in just a moment. And you can say to your buddy, that was the worst thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> you can walk out of here in a little bit and call your wife and say, honey, I can't believe it. This guy was awful. I felt so, uh, I was so sorry for him. I was embarrassed. It, it was pathetic. I can't believe he tried to sing in front of everybody. But see, here's the point. It doesn't matter what you think about my song. Because I wasn't singing for you. I was singing for him. And when he heard, when he heard this man with the voice he gave me, singing a song of praise and worship. Everybody may be laughing, but he is pleased and honored and glorified. You know, and then that's the point. You know, I've spent most of my life never happy with who I was because I stuttered. And a stutterer always feels stupid. I've struggled with that all my life. A stutterer always feels ugly because you make all these faces. I mean, I mean, it's awful. I spent most of my life never satisfied with being me. Always wanted to be like some, somebody else. When I was in grade school, Mark Mentier was that guy. I wanted to be like Mark Mentier. He was so cool. Junior high was Randy Fagan. Man, he grew faster than everyone else. In seventh grade, he was a stud running back. He had everything. All the girls loved Randy Fagan. When I was a sophomore, uh, I mean, in high school, uh, Steve Thomas was a guy. At Baylor, a whole bunch of guys at Baylor. And, and I'm saved at this time. I'm knowing Jesus. But you know what? All this time, man, I didn't want to be me. I wanted to be them. You know what? You know what is incredible? After 59 years of living, you know how awesome it is to discover how incredible it is to be Neil Jeffrey, who Jesus Christ has made me to be. And there's no one else i got to be like, compared to, or nothing. It's just I'm freed up to be exactly who I am. 
Now, I think the world doesn't know that, doesn't understand that. And, and kind of working against that. But, you know, the key is I'm going to keep reminding myself who I am in Jesus. Because obviously at, at, at times I feel things that make me feel all the old stuff I used to feel. And you know what? Every feeling is, is real. But not every feeling is true. Amen. And I'm not going to trust my feelings. I'm going to trust the word of God and what it says. The enemy is robbing me of my self. You know what else the enemy is robbing men of? Their wholeness. You know what? God wanted the man whole. When God took that, that clay, and obviously I wasn't there, but, but uh, uh, he took that clay and fashioned the man. Um, he said, this is good. This is a good thing. He wanted the man whole, body, mind, and spirit. Uh, he wanted a man who, who, who knew who he was, and, and, and was, just, was just whole. You know what? The modern man is anything but whole. He's broken. He's, 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 he's addicted to everything imaginable. He, he's dominated by every imaginable sin. Every demon is, is in that guy's life. I mean, he's, he, he is fractured. There are, there are more self-help groups today and addiction places for men that there's ever been in the history of the world. Why? Because men are not whole. They're, 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 in one sense, a disgrace from who God wanted them to be. You know what? It is, uh, I said this, I think, uh, this morning sometime, that you know, you know, God wanted a man to lead his family. But you know, it's tragic how many men live in, in, in their family. And they're addicted to sex, addicted to drugs, addicted to alcohol. And, and, and the wife spends her whole life defending the man, propping up the man, just mopping up all of his, his messes, all of his stuff, and explaining to the kids. And she spends her whole life. God never wanted a man in that state. He wants a man to be whole, body, mind, and spirit, and strong, and can able to stand up and be the leader God has called him to be. The enemy is robbing us of our wholeness. Jesus wants us whole. The enemy is also robbing us of our um, innocence. You know what? God wants us innocent. He wants us pure, body, mind, and spirit. And uh, uh, in today's world, the uncoolest thing that there is is innocence. Everybody wants to know everything, have done everything, have seen everything, experienced everything. The worst thing you could possibly be is a virgin uh, because it means uh, you hadn't done all this stuff. You hadn't, you hadn't been in that. You hadn't done those things. That's, that's the worst imaginable thing. And, 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 and we brag. We brag about all that we've done, all that we've seen, all that we've experienced in our world. And you know what? It's all available. You can see anything and everything, and be, and probably anything you want to do. <laughs> but you know what? God wanted us pure. In fact, he wanted us innocent of such things. My, my daughter, when uh, she was... Uh, Senior in high school, she um, she um, 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 she was in the choir at at, Rich, at, at JJ Pierce High School up in Richardson, and uh, her senior year, she was you know in charge of all the stuff. And they're selling poinsettias for the big trip in the spring. You know, they make a big trip someplace, and so she's up there. Whole, whole choir's there, and she's up there. Teachers there. She's up there writing down how much you've sold, how much money you still owe, and all that kind of stuff. So one of the guys owed $69. So they said, 69. So she's writing down. Well, everybody starts giggling at 69 as that phrase. Well, she didn't know what, why are they giggling? And, and, and for some reason I said, uh, and she said, what's funny? And of course, they kind of giggled some more, and then, and then she went, what? And then, and then someone in the car says, you mean you don't know? And they all laughed at her. Well, well. My habit was, as, as, as a dad, I'm going to share this tomorrow with us, but, but, but uh, I put my kids to bed every night, and I spent some time with them and so forth. And I put, well, to Natalie, uh, this happened one day. That night, I'm, I'm putting her to bed. And I, you know, I do my thing. I pray. I'll, uh, I'll share my routine tomorrow to get there. But, but I did that. I'm walking out the door. And just I hit the light, walking out the door, and I heard it. heard her say this. You know, only a daddy knows this. I heard her say, Daddy, 
just the way she said it, man, I knew something heavy on her heart. Something's not right. She said, Daddy. Well, I went back. Yeah, baby, why? Watch out. She said, well, something happened today, and it just bothered me. It just, it just really bothered me. She said, why? Tell me about it. Well, of course, I get on my knees right beside her. I'm looking right at her, and she, 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 and she tells me the story of, 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 of what I just told you, that other 69 thing. Now, obviously, um, I mean, you may not know what 69 um, refers to, especially uh, uh, if you don't. Uh, Joe knows. You can ask Joe. He's got, <laughs> he, he, he knows. <laughs> He's got um, I think he's got some pictures, too. I'm not sure. About that. <laughs> you know, but, but anyway, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm off the... But, 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 obviously, it's, it's a reference to a sexual a slang, ungodly, I mean, I mean a, a slang thing with sex. Well, as soon as she told me that story, you know what I did? I just grabbed her in my arms and just hugged her, and I said, baby, you're ashamed because you don't know. That's exactly how God wanted you to be. Because the Bible says in Ephesians someplace or, or something like that, that, uh, that we as Christians, we aren't even to speak of those things that the ungodly do in secret. And, and we, most of the world, in, we're going to speak about it, and we have no problem with even watching the uh, ungodly do it on some screen someplace. God works as innocent, man. You know, uh, I, do, I do a lot of weddings, a lot of counseling, four weddings, during weddings, after weddings, marriages, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's amazing how many guys are getting married. And their first night of marriage, that wedding night, when God, of course, wanted him to be a virgin and innocent and her to be a virgin and innocent, and they come together in that in incredible night that ought to be indescribable in so many ways. But too many guys have watched so much junk on TV, seen so much ungodly, things written by the ungodly, performed by the ungodly, it ain't even real, and they watch all that junk, and in his head he's got all these expectations. This is how it's going to be. This is what's going to happen. This is what I'm going to do. This is what she's going to do. But that's all a lie. And they got all this junk, all this ungodly, ungodly in their head, and they arrive that wedding night, and they're actually disappointed with what takes place that first night. How, un how messed up is that? You know what? What God wanted is a man to be pure, to be a virgin, and to be stupid about such things. But he doesn't know. He spends his life discovering what it's all about with one woman that honors and blesses God, blesses the man, blesses the woman. He wants his innocence. And you know what else is on top of this? The enemy is robbing us of our sexual purity because God, because, because, uh, hey, he, um, God wants us sexually pure. That's, that's First Thessalonians 4.3. Uh, have any doubts about that? Here's what First Thessalonians 4, says, uh, 4 3 says. Something like, uh, now this is the will of God concerning you, even your sexual purity, that you be sexual. God wants us sexually pure, man. And he wants a sexually pure body, mind, and spirit. In fact, if I'm serious about being sexually pure in my body, the only way to make sure I'm sexually pure in my body is to make sure I'm sexually pure in my mind. If I'm pure in my mind, I will never violate and be a uh, step over the line physically. The, uh, he's robbing us of our sexual uh, purity. He's, rocks in, he's, he's robbing us of our relationship with our wives. We've already talked about a little bit. Men, there's nothing, uh, our greatest, a man ought to spend his, his life studying the word of God and studying his wife. And both are filled with mystery. Both have things I'm never going to understand. Both have things you can study and study in the Bible and I still don't know. But you know, isn't it great that God is so big, I'm not going to understand everything about him. Why would I want a God as dumb as I am? I want a God that's going to have some mysteries. You know what? Also, I want a woman that way as well and, and, and do that. He's robbing us of a relationship also with our, our kids. Uh, too many men are, are, um, sacri or trading their relationship with their kids, trading it 
for a career, for money, for position, and for power. There ain't nothing worth out there as much as being the bad guy that's called me to be. And to be with those kids. Well, a few minutes I want to say real quick. We got to hurry. I mean, I mean, cause we got that. Uh, we're late already. But, 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 uh, but, but two images. One image is that. It's that image. First Peter five eight. In fact, I'm gonna get it real quick. Let me just, uh, we're gonna hurry through this. But First Peter five eight. Look at this. Because here's the point. I'm, 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 I'm praying. Hey, God, help me for you to uh, you. Uh, identify in me my fatal flaw. Now, chances are you already know it. Uh, but if not, God, <laughs> show me anything in my life that does not reflect uh, your holiness, your righteousness. Your righteousness. First Peter 5 8. Look at this real quick. Uh, this is written to the elders. Uh, not to Peter is. And so it's, it's Christians he's writing to. But here's what he says. First Peter 5, uh, verse 8. He says, Men, be sober minded. Be watchful, because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. First thing I want you to have in the mind of the enemy, the enemy wants to devour you. And the Bible warns us he's like, a, he's like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now, it's interesting because he says in this thing specifically, he, he's seeking someone to devour. Meaning, in the spiritual world, uh, uh, the uh, enemy, Satan, cannot have anybody he wants. Of course, in the physical world, if a lion's in the room... And he's hungry. I mean, and, and we don't have a gun or anything. Uh, I mean, uh, he has anybody he wants. And the spiritual, the, the, the enemy does not have, he can't have anybody because any man he's walking, filled in the spirit of the living God, walking in the armor of God, the enemy has no power on him. Can't do anything to the man. And yes, the man is, as, as Peter ended up doing, he's walking far from, from Jesus. He's not praying. He's walking in this fight and, and all that stuff. So the image is the, the uh, enemy is seeking somebody to devour. Uh, it's the image of this lion in this room tonight walking through the, this, uh, these, these rows and trying to find somebody who he just sniffs, he just senses, hey, this guy is not right with God. Hey, hey this guy is far from where he used to be in his love for Jesus Christ. He's got some issues. That he's, got, he's got this little corner in his life that's just, that nobody knows about, he thinks, and it's kind of hidden deal. And, and the enemies kind of walk, and, and then suddenly he gets there. And, of course, as they do in the wild, he, he, he uh, uh, identifies the weakest one, and then he just exposes him, and all of a sudden he does again. He just devours the guy. That's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to devour and destroy. Here's the second image I want you to have. Look at Luke, Luke 22. The second image of what the, uh, uh, the uh, enemy wants to do. Luke 22. He... Um, we have, I've been here before, and this, and this, uh, this is a passage because we're citing to Jesus. And, but, but, but here's a little phrase that, that Jesus gives to Simon. He says this. He says, Simon, Simon. Now, when Jesus calls your name twice, like my mom saying, James Neal, I mean, that, 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 it's serious. He says, Simon, Simon, behold. And here's the phrase, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. First image I want you to have that the enemy has, he wants to devour you. Second is he wants to sift you like wheat. Being sifted like wheat is what they did in, 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 in the ancient world in the uh, first century. It, it, what they would do is they would uh, um, harvest uh, wheat and the, uh, uh, the, tares, uh, the uh, weeds at the same time and get it all in one big deal, be in this big wind tunnel, and uh, these things are still over there. You can still see them, and, and they're up on a little hill, and, and they have this deal, and, and there's a floor, and, and, there's, and there's thing in the floor. What they do? They throw the whole thing up, good, bad, everything in there. And the wind exposes, but the wheat is, is heavier, and the weeds, and the um, uh, bad stuff is exposed. It's sifted. It's blown away. And the good stuff falls to the ground, and all they do is sweep it up into these holes. And, and now what it does, it actually falls into a wagon, uh, underneath the thing. Well, the point is, sifted like wheat. You got all the good, all the bad in the same place. And, and, and by eye, you can't even see what's good and bad. But what happens is that sifting goes on, and the bad, which is in there, but nobody knows it's in there, is exposed. What he's saying is, <coughs> what Satan wants to do, Satan wants to expose you 
of something you think nobody knows about. It's in your heart. It's in your mind. It's a sin. It's, it's a, um, a sinful closet. This back little thing you think nobody knows about. What the enemy wants to do is to sift you, is to expose on the outside so all of a sudden your wife knows, your kids knows, the whole world knows. What happened to Jimmy Swagger years ago? Jimmy, when I was in seminary, Jimmy Swagger was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the world, everywhere. He was on cable TV almost 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, man, he could preach the gospel. He'd stand up there. I mean, he'd play his piano and sing songs, and he'd stand up there and preach. I mean, he was awesome. He had this little secret area of sin in his life, this whole deal that nobody knew about. For years, he's got this deal. He's thinking nobody knows. Of course, God knows. You know what? I bet you anything, his wife knew. You know, chances are, if you got an area in your life, you think nobody knows, you think your wife doesn't know, I bet you anything, 99.9%, I bet you anything, she knows. And she's afraid to say anything because she didn't know. Uh, she's afraid of what this means and what's going to happen. But uh, Jimmy Swagger had this little area, and ultimately he got sifted. And what happened was he stands up in his uh, pulpit, and the press is there, and he confesses all this sin, all this stuff. His wife's sitting over there. His kid's over there. There's a church, everybody. And the, wor- and, 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 and the camera's picking it up, and it goes all over the world. What happened? He got sifted. Here's the whole, my whole point tonight. Man, that can happen to any of us. Satan ha- wants permission to devour you, to rob from you, to steal from you, and to sift you like wheat and to expose you to the world. You know, every time a good, godly man blows it, he steps over the line, he goes where he shouldn't be and do what he shouldn't done. You know, I just imagine that all the demons of hell sing that old queen song, another one bites the dust. Another one down, another one down, another one bites the dust. Well, you know what? What I'm saying is, and... Uh, there are uh, uh, a bunch of the fatal flaws. Just real, let me just mention uh, a few of these. Money can be a fatal flaw. Rich young ruler, when it comes to Jesus, I can have eternal life. You better be good. This is he, one thing he lacked. He, was, he, he was rich. Got all the money. He didn't give it before. Because Jesus wasn't interested in money. He was interested in his heart. But his money kept his heart from Jesus. And and you know what? The guy walks away. And, 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 and he decided, you know what, I got a chance to go with Jesus or go with money. I'm going with my money. And he gained the whole world and lost his own soul. Uh, the, uh, the pride is an issue. We've already talked about pride. Huge deal for me. Most athletes struggle with this. Just pride. Man, I wanted to be about me. You know, I was I gifted. And uh, after I played a game, I could, I could scan a sports page and in 10 seconds see how many my name was in the, in, in, wasn't in the deal. Because yeah, well, uh, that's it's all about me. And pride gets in the way. <laughs> now, pride is the, is the, sin, the a sin of King Herod in Acts chapter 12. Herod stands up and makes a speech. And it's such a great speech. All the people say, hey, that was the voice of a God, not the voice of a man. And, and, and because Herod didn't give glory to God, the Bible says God killed him. And the way he killed him, uh, I mean, um, it says this. You read this. It says he was eaten with worms, and then he breathed his last. Then he died. It doesn't say he died and worms ate him. No, he died by being eaten with worms. Now, that's a bad way to go. <laughs> he didn't give God the glory. That this fatal flaw. Uh, a spirit of independence of David. I should have been doing something else. Shouldn't have been where he was. But doing what he was doing. Seeing what he was seeing. Should have been doing something else. But he thinks, you know what, I can handle this. No, no problem. I can my own guy. I'm doing nothing. Well, it, it cost him everything. Busyness is a, can be a fatal flaw. As somebody said, if Satan can't make you bad, he'll just make you busy. And you'll miss what God has for you. People pleasing. Sin of Pilate. How Pilate knew how Jesus was innocent. In fact, five times he says, I find no fault in the man. But Jesus listened to the, I mean, Pilate listened to the crowd just to please the people. You know what? I've struggled with that all my life as well. As a stutterer, I've always struggled with, with being rejected, and all I want to do is be accepted in life. And so, you know, you can get in a trap of just 
just doing what people, you think people want you to do. But you know what? You can't, if you do that, you're just one step away from doing something, as I was last year, just one step away from, 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 from a doing, doing something that maybe pleases the press or dishonors the Lord. The people pleasing you. Lying and deceit can be a fatal flaw. And the sin of Ananias and Sapphira. He just lied to the Holy Spirit. Boom! God killed him. Mm. Then, then uh, of course, the whole idea of, of Samson in Judges 16 says Samson looked down on a Philistine woman. His whole life changed then. Who God wanted him to be was not who he ended up to be. He ended up to be that. Well, just. What do you do if, if this stuff? Well, of course, uh, just uh, hey, we'll be through just a minute. You just want, what do you do? There's fatal flaw. Well, you face your fatal flaw squarely and honestly. You confess it before Jesus. And there's something powerful of a man who says, you know, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Lord, here's my stuff. I got this. There's something powerful. I get something that's been hidden in the darkness for maybe years, getting it out in the light. And the light, the, the exposure to the light and exposure to the grace of Almighty God. Because anything a man confesses, you know what? God forgives. No matter what it is, he forgives. But I've got I've to be honest with that and confess that sin. And confess that. Maybe a second thought is, is this. Hey, I've got to develop a tough attitude about whatever it is in my life that's a fatal flaw. If it's money, if it's if, if it's a TV, if it's a computer, if it's if it's a place, if if if, if it's if, if it's a, a a person, whatever it is, I've got to develop a, a a tough attitude about whatever it is in my life, which is which may could be my fatal flaw. It's how you handle a rattlesnake. You know, cowboys say the only good rattlesnake is a dead rattlesnake. I was at a, a, a I was speaking up in the. Amarillo, just out of, of Amarillo, at the canyon, Palo Canyon, for a, a, a football thing. All these coaches were there and their families, and a beautiful place, all these trees. And, and some kids found, looked under a little a pine tree, whatever it was, and there was a rattlesnake in there. And they thought, oh, isn't that cute? Everyone's coming and looking. The cowboy goes immediately, gets his pistol, come back, and boom! Just, it just it kills the thing. I mean, he knows, hey, if you don't take care of that rattlesnake, that rattlesnake's going to take care of you. you, you got to deal with that. Three, face whatever it is in the power of the Holy Spirit. Face that thing in the power. There is power. There's power in the blood. There's power in Jesus Christ. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is available to you and I. Man, we can walk in victory over this stuff. In the Holy Spirit. Here's, here's number four. What Romans 13, 14 says, man, um, it actually says, put on Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in order to, to, to gratify its desires, it says. You don't make provision for the flesh. You just say, I'm not going there. I'm not going to be there. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not doing this. And then five, you know what? You build strong, accountable relationships in your life. And I've discovered in my life, I am at my best Spiritually speaking, when I'm accountable to some other men who know me, know my strengths, know my weaknesses, know my temptations, know where I'm with, and they're praying for me, they're receiving for me, and they're holding me accountable, and they're asking me questions which nobody else asks. You know, one of the things I miss about playing a sports, you know, like, like football, and I miss this a lot, when you play a sport, you always know exactly where you stand because you have a coach. And if you do it right, he says, hey, Jeffrey, good job. That was good. Well done. But if you screw up, he jumps you. He's, he's on your case. I mean, he's cussing you most of the time. He's slapping you upside the head. He's kicking you. I mean, he's doing But you know what? I mean, you know where you stand, right? You know what I got to do. You know what? In, in the world... A man can go years and have nobody slapping him upside the head. And all of a sudden, he, he ends up way over there where he never wanted to be. And doing the stuff he never wanted to do. And I need the spirit of the living God in my life. You know what else I need in my life? I need to be listening to the spirit of the living God, yes. I need to be studying the word of God, yes. 
But you know, also, I need to be listening to my wife. Yet. Which means nobody loves me. And nobody on earth loves me as much as my wife does. And a man, sometimes because of his pride and ego, just, just kind of dismisses his wife and, oh, she doesn't know, she doesn't understand. No, she knows and she understands. And, man, God speaks truth to me through Sheila in some incredible ways, and I need to listen. And you know what? Every once in a while, I need to ask. I need to ask the Spirit of the living God every once in a while, hey, hey, uh, uh, how am I doing in my life? Or uh, is there anything in my life that, that uh, doesn't honor you, Lord, and doesn't, and doesn't reflect your holiness? And just, just listen. And, and if you says something, write it down. Confess it. Deal with it. You know, also, I need to ask my wife every now and then. Hey, how am I doing? And is there anything in my life you see that's not right? And, and, and ask her and listen and respond and let her say it. And when she says something, don't defend yourself, which is what I always do. <laughs> just, just, just accept it as speaking. And, and you know what? Because, because it's good, you know, uh, 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 they used to say about, about raising a boy, man, a boy needs a good beating every day. <laughs> well, you know what? Basically, if, if I'm really honest, I need a good spiritual beating every day. Just to make sure uh, uh, it, it uh, keeps me on track. And then last, you know, some, some may be having some, some flaws in their life, some things for which you huge and actually need some real help, uh, some real intercession, uh, some real counseling maybe, uh, some real, real good godly help, uh, some good godly people who know what they're doing, who dealt with this thing. Who, because cause, 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 uh, sometimes you've been holding on to, some luggage for so long, and your hands are just frozen on the thing, and you just can't let go. <laughs> but there's help for that. Jesus can help, and some godly people, some trained pros, godly, good. There's some weirdos out there as well, but there's some godly people who can help a man walk in uh, victory. Jesus wants us to experience life and life in, in its fullness. One way we do, you know, if 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 David, if King David had just listened to somebody, you just know, maybe somebody said to him on their way up to the roof, David, David, don't go there. Man, just kind of think, it would have saved David. The year he spent living in hell and his bones were drying up because of his sin, he didn't confess. His, his family rebelled against him. The agony of that, his, his daughter, I mean, all, all that stuff that happened to him, just, just all, all that would have been saved if he said, you know what? Hey, he's right. I got this little area in my life. I keep going up there. I'm, I'm going to deal with this thing right now. That's the point. Because it can be dealt with. Well, let's pray. Well, Lord, uh, I just uh, pray that um, you would say whatever it is that you want to say, uh, you needed to say to all of us. You know, all of us know it's a sin. All of us have been saved from sin by what Jesus did on the cross, been forgiven. And one day we're going to be uh, delivered from the very presence of sin and the power of sin in glory, perfect. But until then, even though I'm forgiven, even though the Spirit lives in me, even though I'm a new man in Christ, even though all this stuff, you know what, the sin is still all around me. And temptation just reels its head. And the enemy wants to bring down and defeat and destroy us. And, 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 and Lord, I want to walk in holiness. Lord, if I step off that, one step off that path, that, that the Old Testament talks about, that highway of holiness, Lord, you slap me upside the head. And help me immediately confess it. And get right. And get back on the path, the way of holiness where you want me to be. Because Jesus, you're the one who said, men, you be holy, even as I am holy. Uh, we can do all things through Christ who strengthen us, even walk in holiness. And that's what we desire to do. Lord, bless us and bless these men that uh, we may be faithful to you all the way to the end. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We used to play together a lot, and you can't tell about what we're playing today, but uh, <laughs> this is one of our favorite songs to do, so we get to, get to do that one.
Ez ugye az lehet, hogy a...
Robertson wrote about the Apostle Paul. He says, Paul stands forever the foremost representative of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, uh, A.T. Robinson did this stuff. I mean, he, he spent his whole life studying stuff in the Bible and Greek and the New Testament. And he says, Paul stands forever as a foremost representative of Christ, the ablest uh, uh, exponent of Christianity, its most constructive genius, its most dominant spirit, from the merely human side, its most fearless champion, its most illustrious and influential missionary, preacher, teacher, and its most distinguished martyr. Yeah. That's not bad. <laughs> that's really what. That's how, he, that's how he ended up. But, but what I want to do is, is kind of look at eight things in his life that uh, happened back in the that God did that uh, ultimately to led him to who, who uh, he ended up being. First, that's our first thing. Paul was a great sinner. In fact, the Bible says a couple of places, it says Paul describes himself in, uh, 
Ephesians 3.8, he describes himself as the least of all the saints. As a result of my path, I'm the least of, of everybody. He describes himself in, in, in 1 Corinthians 15.9 as the least of all the apostles. He was one of the apostles. He said, hey, I'm the least of these guys because I know what I used to do. I know who I used to be. He describes himself in 1 Timothy 1.15 as the chief of sinners. Uh, it's also described as Paul, Acts 26, 9, it uses the phrase describing Paul, he was contrary to Jesus. Anti-Christ. He was the one who was persecuting Christians. It was his assignment as the Jew of Jews, as the Hebrew of Hebrews, to destroy this new sect called, uh, 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 after this man Jesus. And uh, he was the one, it, it, it describes in Acts 8, 1, after the stoning of Stephen, and by the way, he was there at the stoning of Stephen. Yeah. He was the one who, who was standing there, who was obviously in favor of all this stuff, and uh, he held everybody's garments as they threw stones at Stephen. And after, his, after Stephen was stoning, uh, his name, uh, then was Saul of, of Tarsus, but uh, the same guy as Paul. But it says of him, in verse 1 of chapter 8, he ravaged the church from house to house, mm -hmm. just persecuted everybody. He put many saints... Uh, in, in, in prison, a good description of Paul in Acts 9-1 is he was filled with threatening slaughter. He was a blasphemer, persecutor, and injurious to all of those who knew Jesus Christ. <laughs> and the fact is, Paul was a great sinner. It's awesome, though, this great sinner is going to become a great saint. That this great persecutor of the saints is going to end up being a great preacher of the gospel. And this great murderer is going to end up being an incredible missionary that God's going to do an incredible thing in his life. Here's the point. There is somebody who thinks I'm the worst man who's ever lived. I'm the foulest of the foul, the uncleanest of the unclean. I'm, I'm, I'm the miserable, the most miserable. I, everything in my life has stunk. I, I've destroyed everything. I got nothing. I'm the least of everything. I'm the worst. No, the worst that is just kind of man God is looking for. Yeah. To do a supernatural, incredible <clears throat> thing in his life and through his life that tells the world, hey, that's who I used to be. But no, this is who I am now. I'm a whole new man in Christ Jesus. You know, the fact is, sometimes the greatest Christians are those who've been forgiven the most. Yeah. Who've experienced yeah. the greatest grace, become the greatest testimonies of, of a man who gives, who gives a witness to that grace. It, 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 it's the, the fact is they know they've been saved. They know how much grace it, it, it uh, took to get them saved. And they were just overwhelmed with that saved. And they love so much because they know how much they've been loved. You know what? Uh, every, every one of us in our life, have you, uh, you, uh, you may have been, been like this yourself. You thought you're the last person on the planet who would ever be a follower of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And you know what? you got guys in your life, people you know, uh, people you don't even know who you see, you say to yourself, that person is the last. There's no way that a person would ever come to faith and, 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 and say to you. You know, uh, I was all the no guys, and, you know, and, and I said all of us, I see people like that. You know the guys that, that just... Just drives me wild and, and, and crazy. And I, 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 I pray for him. I pray that God will save this guy. Is that uh, that a uh, Bill Moore guy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he just and, and of course I never see him because you know on um, camp stuff that uh, I don't get. But but I've seen him enough through the years. I mean he just he laughs at us. Yeah, he, he laughs. I mean he makes he, and, and of course he can be funny. Of course, in my, in my flesh, I hate so much I can't even laugh anymore at what he said. But, you know, he, he just, I mean, he just, he's so against what we are. Really? Yeah. Really? He, he, he isn't any farther um, away from being saved than the Apostle Paul was. Mm -hmm. And the fact that God can save any man. That's right. No yeah. matter who right. he is, where he is. And I'm afraid that sometimes the, the, the bill is, is just, um, like a, in fact, I heard him made a statement the other day. This is a matter of, he made a statement. He, he, he listened. California, and, and he, 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 he's sick of all the taxes out there, and so he's going to say, you know, I, I'm not sure I want to be a liberal anymore. Is 
<laughs> but, but, but hey, anybody can say my, my, uh, uh, I played football in high a guy named Chuck Whithouse, who was, uh, who went to another junior high, I uh, went to Norwood, on to Bravo, he played against each other all three years in junior high, all through high school, on the same team, he was running back, I was a quarterback, I mean, just, just a good athlete, but he was, I mean, he was a hell of a, I mean, he did everything. He did half the stuff he said he did. I mean, he, he was unbelievable. I mean, he, he's, he's in everything, he's chasing everything, he's, he's sleeping. I mean, he's just doing it all. And and uh, his his uh, his biggest uh, his his uh, he was famous at Shawnee South High School. He was famous uh, for Mooney. <laughs> <laughs> he would moon. That's what he would do. He 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 he, he wait for. A moment and just turn around, put out, and just, just give everybody a shot. Uh, our senior pitcher, we were, we were up at, at, at Metcalf Mall, and on this big field, had, um, we had 900 students in our class. They were all in this big pyramid we built this class pitcher, and they, they, they took this great pitcher, and put everyone now scattered the gold and even so. Sounds on the very top. And just when he thought all, and, and, and uh, all the administrators and teachers were gone. It was just, I mean, he, he turned around about the top of Big Cat South, 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 South. He just moved everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was involved in FCA as, as a high school kid. I was involved in, as, uh, as I was a Christian then. And, uh, you know, I, I was always you know, thinking about Chuck and always, you know, just, man, I need to say something. You know, and this is, and this is always soon. Chuck, if I said anything about coming to church or something about Jesus, I just assume, I just automatically assume that Chuck is going to say no. And I was so convinced he was going to say no, I never even gave him a chance to say yes. I just said, no, he's a last kid. No way he would ever be a rest of this. Because of his life, he wasn't what he was. Well, when he graduated, I went to Baylor. He, he went to, uh, to Baker and all that kind of stuff. You know, I just see. Ten years later, in our high school reunion, I hadn't been at Baylor. I spent my summers in Waco, so I was never home much. I, I didn't say no to anybody. It seemed like we go to our tent, and we're at the Tennessee Royal Stadium Club, where they had the, the reunion, and it's jammed with people, you know, packed. And of course, all these people you meet, you know, you don't know, recognize anybody. And you're just walking through, and I'm on the way to get some tea, and, and, and Sheila's sitting down, and, and, and I'm on the way back, and of course, it just I mean, you just go, excuse me, excuse me, hey, how you doing? I, think, uh, I don't know who you are. Hey, you know, everybody's making their way, and all of a sudden, I come face to face with Chuck Williams. And had him seen since we graduated, he just grabs me. He said, you know, the greatest thing that happened in my life. I met a girl, and I was, I was slipping with this girl, and she wouldn't date me if um, I didn't go to church with her. Well, I didn't care about church. I wanted this girl to go to church. And, you know, church. and I heard that Jesus loved me. Jesus died on the cross, gave me my sins. And I, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Amen. I'm a new man in Christ. And he said, and he said, he said also, you know what else? I, 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 I'm teaching eighth grade boys Sunday school now. <laughs> and of course, of my initial fleshly thought was, man, what are you teaching them? <laughs> <laughs> but he was but the point is, man, I thought he was the worst of the worst. But you know what? God had a plan for yeah. Chuck Bass's life. He had a plan for Paul's life. He's got a plan for every man's life. Yeah. Look at this. When Paul gets saved, that whole story is in Acts chapter 9. We don't have really time to read all that. But Acts, if you want to just turn to it, we'll be there a couple of times in the next moment or so. But Acts 9, um, he was the worst of the worst. And... Uh, He's on his way to Damascus. He first teaches more Christians, and 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 uh, uh, God hits him with a light from heaven, yeah. a holy light, and 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 and, and it's suddenly a light. Verse three, light from heaven flashes around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, "Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me?" He said, "You are said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Go ride into the city, and 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 and, and you will be told what you're to do." And in fact, what happened there? Two things. What happened here? He saw a great light, and he heard a loud voice. Yeah. He remember those two things. And then, and then the men who were telling us to give him up saw a rose of heaven, so, so, so. Verse, verse 10, he's, he's, uh, this guy is feared by every Christian. 
And there's a disciple at Damascus, his name Ananias, and the Lord said to him a vision, Ananias. And I said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise, Ananias. You go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for both he's praying. And he had seen in a vision that a man named Ananias, which is you, was going to come lay hands on him, and you know that he may be his side. But Ananias says this. Here's the response. Ananias says, God says to him, hey, you go talk to this Saul of Tarsus about me. Ananias says, verse 12, verse 13, that Ananias said, Lord, I've heard from many about this man. How much evil he has done to all your saints in Jerusalem, and he has, has had the authority from the chief priest to bind all who call in your name. He says, Lord, obviously you don't know who this is. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bad dude. This is the guy of, of every man on the planet. This is, this is for sure the guy who would never be a follower of you because he's the guy who, 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 who kills people to follow. But here's the response from the Lord. But the Lord said, you go. But this one is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel, and I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. I've got a plan for this man's life, Ananias. Ananias, you don't worry about who it is. You just be sure who I am. And I, as a God, can do anything I want, and I want you to see him because I've got a great plan. You know, the fact is, you got this plan for my life, you got a plan for your life. God, I'm sorry, he's got a plan for every man's life. He was a great sinner. That's the first thing. But secondly, he got saved. He met the living Christ. A glorious conversion. He got converted and he got a new name. He went from Saul to Paul. He got a new heart. He got a new head, new priorities, new directions, new passions. Everything was changed. What happened is he saw that great light and he heard that loud voice. Man, the fact is, everyone who gets saved is because their eyes have been opened and they see what they've never seen before and they hear what they've never heard before in a fresh part of the way and they realize who Jesus Christ is, who they are, how they need Jesus in their life. And what they do is get on their knees, confess their sin, ask Jesus Christ in their life, and the miracle of miracles which is indescribable, God steps out of heaven and steps into a man's life. Come on, preach. And everything changes in the man. An incredible conversion. Now, if you say explain how that happens, there's no way we can explain it. Right. There's no way. I mean, and, 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 and you know what? In one sense, it has to be like that. Because see, if it's any other thing, if it, it's just, hey, Check three boxes, uh -huh. and, and then you're going to be it. And we know how to figure out how to work the system to fix the boxes and do it in faithful and artificial. <coughs> or if it's just, hey, walk down an aisle in the church. Well, thousands, millions of men have walked down an aisle in the church, never been changed. Or, or, or just even be baptized. Now, we need to be baptized. See, some guys have just dug the water in this thing. Hey, just check the list. It ain't any of that stuff. But it's as simple as a man confessing his sin, confessing who Jesus is, asking him in his life, and when he does that, the man literally is born again. Yeah. Now, um, again, it, it, it's, it's, it's so miraculous, it, it's unexplainable. And it's so simple, it's almost stupid. Yeah. <laughs> That's why he, he says, hey, the, the preacher of the... And gospel is too much as you know what I'm saying. But, but uh, you know what? Um, I, I, I still, I mean, what uh, blows me away is just, it's just, just being there for a man gets saved. Yeah. I mean, there ain't nothing like that. Nothing. I mean, I had a guy in our church. <coughs> I'm, I'm standing at the, at the Oliver Church. Had offered an uh, invitation and we give him it's in our church at everything. I mean, it don't matter what. Amen. We're going to do an Easter deal. We have to have about all the kids for a, uh, a, a bunny deal. I mean, an Easter egg deal. This, this coming Saturday, and all of our camps, we do all that kind of stuff. But we're going to let them do that, but we're going to get them more together and tell them the story of Easter about Jesus. Amen. Okay. And you're going to do give an invitation. And we always get letters and emails from people out there saying, hey, man, you ruined the whole, whole occasion. 
You messed the whole buddy thing up when you start talking about this Jesus. <laughs> we apologize. We say we're sorry, but you know that's just who we are. That's what we're going to do. I'm standing here with this thing. This guy uh, comes forward, and I mean, obviously, as soon as I saw him, I know who, who this is. This is a good-looking guy in his fifties. Obviously, had money. He's well dressed. He comes forward. He comes to me. He said, "You know, Neil, uh, uh, the thing in my life, I, I, I'm, I'm losing everything." He said, I, I'm, uh, my wife this morning kicked me out of the house. He said, never come back again. He said, I'm a sex addict. I'm addicted to drugs. I'm an alcoholic. I got nothing. I'm losing everything. I got nothing. Well, I grabbed him. We go in, in the room. I mean, usually we stay here. You don't do all that stuff. I said, no, no, we went back and talked. Man, we wasn't. He, 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 uh, he trusted Jesus. I mean, Lord, I said to him this. I said, I said, uh, Bob, you want to be saved? You don't need to be saved. You want to be saved? He said, yeah, I got to be saved. He said, uh, I said, well, uh, this is what we're going to do. Now, used to, I used to always have a man, uh, I would I say the sinner's prayer and have the man to say it after me. You know, it just, I stopped it. Uh, uh, don't do that anymore. I said to Bob, Bob, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray. We're going to ask Jesus in your life. And what we're going to do, you're going to kneel at that chair right here. I'm going to kneel on my desk, my chair right here. You're going to pray. You're going to ask Jesus in your life. And you're going to pray out loud so I can hear you. Of course, as soon as you say that, the guy says, oh, I can't. What do I say? I don't say it. I'm going to pray. I don't know how to do this. I said, uh, uh, you don't matter what you say. If it's real. If it's, you just say what's in your heart. If you know you're a sinner, just, just tell him that. You just say what's in your heart. He said, okay. And you're saying that loud so I can hear, so I can be a testimony, a, 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 a witness for this rest of your life. I know, hey, Bob, you got doubts? I was there. I know what happened. You're going to say it out loud. She's okay, I'm going to do it. He kneels and he prayed. Guys, that prayer, prayed by Bob on that morning, and every man I've had do that, that prayer is always the greatest prayer I've ever heard. Because it's not fake, it's not phony, it's not sorry, I mean, it's real. It's a man who's desperate, who's lost, who's losing everything in his life. He knows he's so dysfunctional and screwed up, but he knows I am dying. Someone's got to save me. And see, that's all the stuff he said, Pastor. Like after he prayed, he gets up. But she starts crying in the crowd. I start crying. Well, he said, hey, man, you know what I did? I said, Bob, Bob, look at me. You got to look at me. That's the greatest prayer I've ever heard. Because it is. And you know what? When he stands up, I mean, yeah. you can't fake. You can't manufacture what the man looks like. Yeah. You can't factor what's in his eyes, what's coming through his spirit. Yeah. I mean, it didn't join a club. It didn't sign up for something. It's being radically saved by Jesus who invaded his life and cleansed him up and made him a holy man. That doesn't happen to the ball. You know, the fact is, I mean, every one of us, his conversion was glorious. Bob's conversion. Well, the rest of that story of, of, of Bob Sweeney, he, uh, of course, uh, 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 we talked for a while because after he's, he, he takes it, well, well, what do I do now? Well, I said, uh, uh, you got to go home. He says, I, I can't go home. She kicked me out. I didn't know to see me. I said, well, you got to go home and tell your wife. You trusted Jesus. He goes home. Tells her. It's, it's <laughs> hell for a little bit. So he calls me. We talked to the girl. The next Sunday morning, I'm standing in the same place. I always stay at 11 o'clock service. Pam Sweetie, his wife, comes forward. Trusts him. He's all right. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> That's for us. I guarantee it. Every man in the room can stand up at this point. That's what it's all about. It's getting saved. My dad. And my dad, when he was, um, um, oh, we got right. <laughs> my dad, when, uh, when um, he got saved, of course, I, 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 I think I said, well, his, his dad was an alcoholic. His, his family was, he gets a, he's a, he, he's a junior of Hayward, 1948. He's flunking out of school. He's struggling with football. I mean, his whole life's falling apart. He's got nothing. Yeah, um, he just he said, uh, 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 "You gotta go home. I, I gotta talk to mom because of only standing, only rocking in his life was his mom. His dad was not gonna let him as a sophomore. My dad never saw him again the rest of his life. He never ever saw his dad. So he hits like all the way from Waco to Corpus Christi. He goes home. 
He, uh, his last ride, he lets him out about a mile from the house. I've heard my dad tell the story a hundred times. He, he's the prince all the way home that last mile, jumping over Mr. English's at the, the backyard and fencing across the, his chicken farm and in, in his dad's uh, and mom's house with all the, uh, of no door was ever locked because my dad's mom never let the door uh, ever be locked. Just in case Mr. Jeffrey, my dad's dad, had decided to come home, it'd be easier to him to get him out. So he puts everything's dark, it's loaded in the morning, he opens the door, goes in, walks in, into the, his mom's bedroom, sits down on the bed, which he always used to do when he came home today, and he reached out, and nobody's in it, and hadn't been slept in. He turns on the light, looks through the house, can't find it, goes next door to Mr. English's house, knocks on the door, and, and Mr. English comes around, oh, now Jeff, I thought you knew. Your mom had a nervous breakdown, she's in the hospital, she may not make it through the night. And my dad's whole world is falling apart. He goes home in the, uh, his mom's bedroom, kneels beside her bed, and prays this prayer. God, if you're up there, like mom says you are. And if you're listening to me, as mom says to you, you would always listen to me. And if you're, forgive me, as mom said, you would forgive. And cleanse me and come into my life the way mom always said to come into my life. Make me a new man. I'm asking you right now to do my dad got saved that night, that long, very good. No cameras, no nothing. There's one guy that went on his knees. But you know, here's the point. It changed his whole life. Changed the course of his life. And you know what? Changed my life. Yes. I don't get it here. If God in 1948 hadn't done a miracle, yeah. my dad would be a great man. He got saved. Man, that's the point. Great, great a sinner, but a great a conversion. Here's number three. Real quick, we've got to hurry. Number three. He gets disciple. Paul gets disciple. Uh, we get saved, we're a baby. And then we got to grow up. First, all we want is milk. And then after a while, a man doesn't just live on milk. you got to have some need of the Word of God. Well, Paul gets disciples. In fact, he spends three years in Arabia and, 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 and uh, Damascus. And he goes to Jerusalem. He spends maybe 15 days with the disciples in the old city of Jerusalem. That would be awesome. Having, having those guys tell Paul, here's what happened in this place over 15 days ago. And then, he spends, he, uh, uh, he goes to Tarsus, in, uh, his home, because, well, before that, he, uh, he goes uh, to Jerusalem and, 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 and Arabia and Damascus. He spends time there. He, he goes to Tarsus, and, he, and he's there for a period of time. He's learning, he's working, he's serving, he's preaching. But nobody knows it. Here's the point. He spends maybe 10, 14 years after he got saved, before he hits the scene as the preacher to the Gentiles. 14 years. Nobody knows where he is. You know what he's doing? He's building his relationship with Jesus Christ. He's going deep. He's experiencing it. He's saying, God, whatever you got in your hand. And for 14 years, he's just going deeper with Jesus. And then finally, after 14 years, he has to sing, and God takes him all over the place. <coughs> See, a man always gets consumed with, man, how great I'm going to be. You don't worry about how great you're going to be. You just worry how deep you're going to go with Jesus. Amen. Amen. You just build a foundation in your life. So when the moment comes, and the challenge is there. You step up and God has you ready exactly as the man he wants you to be. You know what? It was awesome. When the time and Paul met, this is the moment. God has his man ready. And boom! All this stuff had to happen because of the point. It's just, uh, you got to sign. I had a little story I was going to share here, but, it, but well, uh, let me show the story. It's just, it's just, uh, this is a deal we did in, in uh, in a uh, uh, youth camp, when I, I did youth in this community, a candle game, where we would, we would, uh, we started out, I can't idea, but it was a classic idea, where we, at, at, at the evening of the youth camp, one night, we get everybody, a uh, uh, whole group is huge, <coughs> and everybody's in a group of, uh, of, uh, is that eight, eight kids in a circle, and, and everyone has a number, so you're a one, two, three, four, five, oh, uh, whatever. And what we would do is, Turn off all the lights. And uh, if you want to get saved, you've got to have a candle. And of course, it's pitch black in the room. You can't see anything. But the only way you can be saved is, and this is just a game, an allegory, is, is uh, you've got to get a candle. But the only way you can get a candle is, uh, you've got to know the code. And I'm the only one who knows the code. So the game starts. Uh, it's it, it's document one number four, and, 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 and pitch black. I, I'm standing up front. I like this candle because I say something like, you know, I get that. In the beginning was the word, word was God, the word was my grandma. And, 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 and,
it was like it was like the light of men. I start to mess and mess with it. Now what I do, I go to a guy, to you, and show you the code. And as soon as you can memorize the code and know the code, uh, and you get a candle over here, and you say the code to a guy, and then I light your candle. And then you, and then you go tell somebody else, and I go tell somebody else. And then as soon as you tell somebody, then you look over and so on and so on. Like, like, how do you say it? What you got to know? And, and, and you see it spreading. But every once in a while, you would hear this eerie music playing, which meant the death angel was going to speak. Because kids love stuff like that. So, so everything has to stop. So even if you're sharing Christ with somebody, and also you're going to stop right there. And the death angel speaks. And the death angel will say something like that. There was a wreck on the way home from the camp. All the sickness were killed. If you're six, and you don't have a candle, you go to hell. If you're six, and you got a candle, you go to heaven. And, and heaven was always in, in, in the other side of the building. And, 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 and it was, you know, <clears throat> we had food and drinks. It was kind of neat. Like <laughs> <laughs> hell, hell was in the kitchen. <laughs> and it was hot. We had all the kind of demons in there. I mean, I mean, to make it, of course, it was a game, but still, some girls freaked out with it. I mean, but, but, well, but after a while, everybody started realizing, hey, I gotta get a camera. Or if you got a camera, hey, I gotta find somebody. And also, we had, had brothers who, who were finding their brother, and they said, hey, you gotta know this code, share this code. Well, the code was three verses. When it was 323, all sinners were short of the way of God. When it was 623, the wages of sin is death. Get to God and eternal life with Jesus Christ. In Romans 10 13, for if you ever call upon the name of the Lord, will be saved. That's the code. You know that, you're saved. Well, of course, there was a great game, a great deal about, about life, about witness, about, about life, death, about heaven, all that stuff. But you know what we found out? We didn't even plan this as, as a lesson. This just came out. We also found out some people were so anxious to get out doing stuff that they never really fully memorized. And they would say it fast and go just to get the candle. And, and, and but all of a sudden we realized, you know what? Once they got the candle, they were useless in the game. Because they didn't know the three verses. They couldn't tell someone else the three verses. That's discipleship, man. That's growing up. All those people again, they were impotent in the game to make a difference. And so, man, we gotta grow up. Every Paul, no, every Timothy needs a Paul. Who's investing in them, and, and uh, every Paul needs a, a tool, somebody who invested in them. You know, I need somebody invested in me, and I need to be invested in somebody else. He got discipled. He, 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 uh, uh, spiritually grew up, and he got, uh, uh, he went deep. You know what he did for, real quick? He got busy. Oh, he got busy. He did a, a thing, I mean, a whole bunch of things. He wrote two thirds of the New Testament. He started hundreds of churches all over the, the known world. He traveled thousands of miles on foot and horseback and boat. He discipled many men, led many to Christ. And the things he did, all the stuff he did, will never burn away and last you forever. He got busy on behalf of the Lord Jesus and did it. Now, here's the point. Before he met Jesus, he did the anti-Christ thing very, very well. You know what? After he met Jesus, he did before Jesus Christ even better. Yeah. Some guys do an incredible, an incredibly good job of raising hell. Do it where Satan himself is proud of this guy and what he does. How he does. The hell he raises. The havoc he creates. But it, it's tragic. Are too many guys trust Jesus and they never accomplished the same thing on the other side. They were busy for Satan for themselves doing this thing, but never really become as busy on the other side of truly honoring Jesus and truly doing work over here that they raise as much heaven on this side as they raise hell on the other side. Mm -hmm. He got busy. Here's what else he did. A five. He got focused. Hey, he was out of this, this kind of game of worried about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the in the uh, Sadducees and, and uh, all the other seas, I, 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 I didn't worry about any of that. <coughs> anyway, hey, I got one person I'm going to please, and that's Jesus. I'm not worried about anything. He got totally focused. He realized he simplified his life, man. He said, hey, I got to say no to a bunch of things, even some good things, in, in light of the best things. Hey, somebody in here, share with me, uh, uh, 
the other day, you know what the uh, enemy of, of God's best is? Man's good. <laughs> Somebody said that here. Well, that's good. Some things I realize, hey, I shouldn't be involved in for moral reasons. It's not right. But other things I shouldn't be involved in because there's a higher, higher something I need to be doing. I need to be involved in. He wanted to preach, teach, and reach people for Jesus Christ. He knew who he was. He knew why he was here. He knew what he was going to do. He said, I am focused on this thing. You know, I spent, I spent too many years of my life uh, just, just wanting to be seen as a big. And as a youth minister, I got involved in all this stuff I shouldn't have been involved in. All these youth metro meetings, all these statewide things, all these national, you know? And, and really, I hated it because I'm not an administrator. I hated this. The uh, uh, only reason I did it because, you know, it made me feel like I'm, I'm more of a big than I really was. You know what? I really have to go, hey, man, I'm sacrificing time with my family, with my wife. Hey, I need to say no to all that stuff. And you realize, man, I, I'm, I'm focused on Jesus and my ministry and my wife. You know what? I, I, uh, I, uh, I realize, I realize, kind of someplace, I back up. I'm not going to be a uh, good God. Now, I could be a good God. No question. Hogan said, any athlete can be a five or under a handicap. Mm-hmm. But you got to practice. Yeah. you got to play. you got to hit ball. you got to get all that stuff. You know what? I realize, I can do that. But if I do that, I'm going to compromise my life. Yes. I'm going to compromise mm-hmm. my I'm going to compromise what God wants me to do. You know, it ain't, it ain't worth that. So, man, I'm going to let you got for me. You know what else? Six real quick, he got humble. He got humble. In fact, in those, uh, look at uh, second, second Corinthians uh, uh, 12. You know this real quick. I'm just going to hit this real quick. But uh, second Corinthians 12, uh, he had a thorn in the life. And, and, and the reason he had that thorn, uh, because in those 14 years, when, when Paul was being discipled, God showed him some things no man had ever seen. In fact, in fact uh, here's what it says. He says, um, uh, um, um, uh, he says in verse 2, uh, saying, I know a man in Christ which was himself, he says. He 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether the body or the body, I don't know. God knows. And I know this man was caught up in paradise. Whether the body or the body, I don't know. But God knows. And he heard many things that cannot be told. This man may not utter. And on behalf of this man, I will boast. But not on my own behalf, I will not boast, except for my weaknesses. Though I should wish to boast, I should not be for I'm speaking the truth. But I would refrain from it in order that no one may think more of it. He says to me, so, verse 7, all these things God did. So he says, God, to keep me from being too elated, too cocky, of all these surpassing greatness of the revelations, to keep me from being just a guy who should be like, man, I'm a star now, I'm a stud, I'm going to get a bus, I'm going on the road, I'm, I'm making a video, all that stuff. He said, instead of that, God gave me a, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, your ass me, to keep me from being too late. Three times I've with the Lord about this, this will leave me. He said, no, I'm not taking this away. My grace is enough for you, son. And he says, God says, my power is made perfect in your weakness. Yeah, right. So Paul says, therefore, knowing that, I would rather boast of the more gladly my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul said, man, I realize I got this thorn. This is terrible. I don't want it. I have to take away. I realize this thorn is the reason I'm experiencing the power of God in my, in my weakness. So Paul said, you know what? If I got a choice, between having the thorn and having the power of God, or being thornless but therefore powerless, I'd rather have a thorn. I'd rather experience God and the power in my life. You know, man, some of us have got to realize the struggle we struggle with may be the thing God wants to do use in our lives to, to one, make us like Jesus, two, be a witness to the world, and three, bring on the word here. That thing he wants to show his power. All God humble. And you know what? Man, all of us, all of us need to be humble. All of us have, have stuff in our life at times that we need to be. That's why man, we need to be listening to our wives. I need to be humble for my wife. Now, I, 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 I'm the leader, and, and, and I'm responsible at all. That falls on me. I'm just sure I need to listen to her, responding to her, and uh, uh, humble myself. You know, I just, I just, I don't, I don't know this, but uh, I got a text from this might not even know. I think, I think, uh, Cush McCarthy's wife died. Did you 
heard that? No. Well, it was, it, it was on the way down here, I think. I got a pastor art or something. And but Bill McCartney is the uh, old uh, coach at uh, the University of Colorado on a national championship there. Uh, the start of Promise Keepers. Well, he was the guy I saw. I didn't know when they were live, I saw it on tape. It was a huge stadium at, at, at Bowl, University of Colorado Stadium, with 65,000 men in the den. He has his wife on stage, and he actually strips himself down to his shorts and washes the wife, the uh, feet of his wife. I mean, 65,000 guys just stood up after it was awesome. Well, you know what? That one, he was called love and honor and serve all that stuff. She now is gone. She was Jesus. Man, it just, just, that says all kinds of things to me. But anyway, uh, uh, you got humble. Here's seven real quick. Two more. Good uh, seven, he got used. God used him. And you know what? God used him up. <laughs> Since that God wore him out. Yeah. But he went full speed, 100% died with his boots on. Amen. I mean, God used that man. Often the man God most greatly breaks is the man God most greatly uses. He just spilled out and he was died for being spilled out and used up for the glory of God. He said his whole purpose was to be created to preach the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. That's what he did. And you know what? He goes to full speed. He got, you know, there, there is, uh, I'm, I hope and pray that all of us, hopefully you've had this experience, but just have this sense. You know what? God is using you. There are a few things in life sweeter than that. Amen. Maybe since, man, I can't even explain this, but for God has used me in the life of a man. Mm -hmm. I do have a party with a men's deal. You know, I have a man, and this sounds like a brag, I guess not. I'll probably I'll you to say this, but if one of the highest uh, blessings for me is when a man comes up, I see him on church and comes up. Exactly. I want you to know. I probably want to be a man's up chain. I'm not the same man. I'm just coming that with us. He's a man here. He preached. And that's where he got me. It changed my life. Well, that, that is about as sweet as it gets. Only thing sweeter than that is when I'm walking through church and a, a woman walks up to me. Okay. I might not even know. She says, hey, I want to meet you and introduce myself. And, 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 uh, <coughs> I, I, I want you to you know this. And she says, my husband, not to say. I mean, that's all. Awesome. Yeah. But the wife comes and says, hey, my husband uh, has been changed. I mean, there's nothing like being used by God. And, 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 and he wants to use us. He wants to fill us up. He says, fill us up with Jesus. <clears throat> Just like that sweet perfume. You know, as ugly <clears throat> as my life was and at times can be, man, he wants to fill us up with sweet perfume. Then he wants to break us and spill out that perfume so it flows and fills up my wife, my family, my home. And anybody who crosses our paths smells that sense, senses that sense, just feels what Jesus is doing in our life. That's what he wants to do. Paul also developed that can do attitude. I can do all things through Christ. Just um, he can. He did. Nothing stopped him. And then at the end, all this stuff. Uh, he dies. Here's what he said at the end. I preached this. This is a good, good sermon message for a uh, a good godly guy. I, I use this all the time. Here's here's the end. Paul says this. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. Second Timothy four six. I'm already being being poured out as a drink offering. I've been, I've been spilled up. And the time of my departure has come. That's his death he's talking about. He doesn't say death. He says departure. The death for Christians is not the end. You get it. And he says this. Hey, I want everyone to know I fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. God, I pray that he's saying at the end. Lord, he did it well. He honored his God. He wasn't perfect, but he honored his God. He loved his wife. He, he represented Jesus Christ's will. He finished the race all the way to the end. Our assignment, life goes all kinds of stuff at us, a bad, ugly curve. It's, it's, it's awful at times. Our assignment, it's just whatever comes, be faithful all the way to the end. 
finish strong, and then I've kept the faith. Hits forth, he says, here's later from me. The crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. Not to me only, but to all who love this period. Mm -hmm. uh, he on the other side, he said, he looked back and said, I'm going to fight for this first. I kept the faith on the other side. <coughs> I get the crown of righteousness, eternal life. I get heaven. You know what else I get? I get Jesus. Mm -hmm. Forever and ever and ever. Of Paul's death. At the end, he stands by, somebody wrote this, he stands by his faith and urges those who remain here with the fight. But just, if he's saying this, just, just as he's about to die. There's no signs of surrender to the Apostle Paul, no note of defeat. He's as calm as he beholds the end that is, is here. He simply carried his load to the end of the journey. He doesn't boast. He's humble at the feet of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He does exult in knowing that he's kept the faith. He's proud of this. And facing death, he doesn't doubt Jesus. If there's anything he knows, he knows Jesus. Because his prayer was that I may know him, and I believe and I'm persuaded. And he is able to keep that which I've committed uh, uh, unto me and, and, and unto this day. He knows that that day is now coming. And he can trust Jesus. He knows that that day of departure has come. Uh, he will be uh, released from his harness like a faithful horse at the end of a long day's journey, that's the departure. He will be seek to rest from his trouble and strife. He's glad he's had his share of the work. He's not worried about his enemies, but the Lord will deliver him from every evil work. He knows he will be saved unto his heavenly kingdom. He still has his interest in earthly things, but his eye is set on, on things on high. He knows he has a crown of righteousness laid up for him with the righteous judge. He no longer worries about what that evil judge Nero uh, uh, is going to do. He now he will appeal to the supreme judge of the universe, the highest court, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and the righteous judge is going to give him that crown. Uh, uh, he knows he's going to depart and do this work. It's this far. How better than stay here and, uh, and be alive? Paul had once revolted and hated and, 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 and a person contributed against the notion of a crucified Messiah Christ. Now that cross has become the Paul's glory. He will bear his own cross. Just as he already bears the brand marks of Jesus in his life. He's taken outside of town and beheaded. What a way to live. Amen. What a way to die. What a way to go. That's a life worth living. Let me pray. We'll, we'll thank you for the life of the Apostle Paul. The story is, it ain't about Apostle Paul. <coughs> it's about the Christ and the Apostle Paul. And all that happened in Paul's life, his testimony would be, it ain't about me, what I did. It's about who you are, what you do in us. Lord, help us to realize that all of us here, we, uh, we want to do great things in us. Lord, as we conclude this morning after a little break, a little session in the Lord's and all that, just uh, you can keep speaking whatever you need to say. Us to hear and respond. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And also, uh, we're going to break. Also, I, I, I think and this is what we can do. But 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 uh, but uh, 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 we have a book over there. One for twenty bucks if you like to But also, I think my wife is going to be about there. If you'd like to meet her, she'd like to meet you as well. I think she's going to be out there. She's worth meeting, by the way. Let's <laughs> <laughs> take a uh, five minute uh, break. Take about five minutes. No. Come on back. Ten minute break. Ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs>